Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Now this is gonna be another video on carbon versus aluminium bikes and the differences between the two. Now a few weeks ago, I kind of did the first video in this series. Well, it wasn't actually supposed to be a series, but it turned out to be quite popular in the comment section. And in that first video on carbon, we basically looked at the material properties alone. So just the flexural or Young's modulus of carbon versus aluminium for bike frames. And we actually deduced a typical layup of a tube in carbon fiber. And actually it turned out to be not that much stiffer than aluminium. So when you lay the carbon plies off axis to the like principal loading, the Young's modulus gets decreased. In this video, we're gonna look at how the tube shape and wall thickness and geometry of the tube actually affects the stiffness as well. And quite rightly, in the first video, a lot of people in the comments said, well, you haven't discussed, you know, that carbon tubes can be a lot wider and they can be in different shapes and actually that that's important for the stiffness as well. And that's absolutely correct. You'll see in this video actually that the geometry of the tubes affects the stiffness of the, the tube way more than just the material properties. Now, a while ago on my channel, I did a bike review and I was kind of rating the bike in terms of stiffness and compliance. And I had lots of angry people in the comments say, how can you tell what stiffness it is, you know, if you haven't put it through a bending test or measured the deflection in each tube, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, quite rightly, I can't to an exact figure. But when you take into account that bending stiffness and tube deflection isn't actually that much, there's, not, there's no witchcraft going on, okay? It really relies on two things. The, the geometry of the tube, so the shape, the wall thickness, and what we call the second moment of area, and, and the material, the, the Young's modulus or the flexural modulus of the material. And that's it, there's no more witchcraft involved. For example, in this bag, I have two seat posts, a lightweight carbon one, and not so lightweight aluminium one. Now you might think, watching the first video, the carbon one's gonna be stiffer, but we need to take into account the geometry of the tubes. This one is a massive wall thickness. It's actually kind of overlies with a very heavily butted side to it. And this one is quite thin walled and round. So although they have the same outer diameter, the second moment area of these tubes is vastly different. And this one is massively stiffer and it's aluminium. The bike industry went mad for a couple of years thinking that all compliance uh, of the rear end of a bicycle came from the seat stays or the rear triangle. And it's like, come on guys, this rear triangle is a stiff object. It's a truss, it's a triangular beam with the load applied here. You think that's gonna deflect? And they ignored this great pulse sticking out the top. And people were looking at this, oh yeah, the flattened chain stays in Canada on the thin seat stays in Cervelo were giving compliance. It's a triangular structure. It's what they make, roll cages and, go and look outside, go and look at a bridge. <coughs> stiff, triangular structure not designed to bend. If you want to build a really compliant road bike, chop the seat stays off. Just have the chain stays and, and the seat posts, that'll give you enough compliance. But the only reason we have seat stays is for the UCI regulations, because we have to, we have to have the double diamond shape. You, you can have a bike with just, if you, have, if you increase the thickness of the chain stays, so they had a lot more bending stiffness, by increasing the depth, which you'll learn about in this video, the second moment of air. You'd have a perfectly stiff enough bike up and down in the chain stay to ride it without seat stays. So if you want to tune in compliance and have optimal aero and stuff, just chop the seat stays off the bike. Like who's gonna bring out the bike which isn't UCI compliant? Okay, without much further ado, let's get into the detail of the tube stiffness. First of all, we're gonna do a quick recap of what we did in the first video, which was Young's modulus, and we call that E. We did that for carbon and aluminium. But actually, to evaluate a tube or a frame stiffness, we need to take into account EI, which is a combination of E and I. So in this video, we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at what I is, second moment of area. And then finally, we're gonna look at parts of the bike where you can kind of use this to start analyzing stiffness and compliance properties of, of one frame versus another. And when once you know EI, that's it, there's nothing else to learn in terms of the science of tube bending or tube stiffness. So you can no longer be sold lies about stiffness in bikes. I don't know if you know, but way back in AD 289, in the first ever bicycle industry marketing symposium, which was titled Selling to Clueless Threads Lesson One, the main take from that symposium was, if you complicate the subject matter with so much science, you can pretty much lie about it. And that's been prevalent throughout the decades and millennia until now. And it basically means if you baffle people with something they don't understand, it's very easy to sell claims about it. And this is prevalent in cosmetics, 
automotive, hi-fi audio, and it's very prevalent in the bike industry in aerodynamics because it's so complicated for most people and it's very hard for a customer to validate. Anyway, what did we discuss in video one? Well, material properties and the Young's modulus. We deduced a laminate stiffness of a carbon down tube and we actually discussed how the stiffness gets diluted when you start laying the carbon fibres off axis. And then we discussed, actually, it's very hard to understand the load cases on the whole frame. These load cases and the priority of these load cases dictate the layup and the equivalent Young's modulus. So if you want a very stiff torsional rigidity, you do have to sacrifice some bending stiffness and vice versa. So actually, we came out with a, a carbon laminate stiffness or equivalent stiffness is between 72 to 105 gigapascals. Now, that has, actually wasn't that much stiffer than just plain old aluminium. And it all depends on the layup. And then just for comparison's sake, we've got steel and titanium. Steel in particular is the stiffest in this table by far, but it's obviously a lot heavier. And titanium, I have to say, is a very nice material to make a bike from because it's a nice mix of weight and stiffness. And just before we go any further, please do like, subscribe and comment if you like this kind of thing. But you're all educated, so chances are you already have. EI. So actually, is all you need to quantify a tube's stiffness. We did E in the last video, so what the hell is I? So it's what we call second moment of area in engineering or first moment of inertia. But anyway, you don't need to worry about that. And what is it? Well, it's the inherent stiffness of a cross section, regardless of the material. Or in slightly more complex terms, it's the distribution of a shaped cross sectional area about its centroid. Now, it's measured in meters to the four. It's kind of a, a random unit. You don't really need to worry about the unit as such. But anyway, a higher I or a higher second moment of area means it's stiffer. And in general, if you have a tube or a rectangular beam, if you increase the diameter of the tube or increase the breadth or height of the beam, it gets stiffer. For instance, if we're looking at bicycles, let's, let's approximate and say we're using round tubes. If you double a tube's diameter, its second moment of area, and therefore its stiffness, gets 16 times stiffer. So if you say you started with a 25 mil tube and you went to a 50 mil tube diameter, it would actually get stiffer by 16 times because for tubes at least the second moment of area increases with radius to the power of four or diameter to the power of four in the rectangular shape example it's still quite extreme actually it increases with the height of the tube to the power of three now it does depend on which way you're bending the tube so if you're bending this rectangular section here in this bending direction it's a lot stiffer than in this direction and that is how you must evaluate second moment of area it does depend on the orientation of the shape apart from when you're looking at cylinders or, or hollow tubes it has the same stiffness in all direction basically and that's really why round tubes are really really good if you have very complex loading on a structure so if you have let's say a car space frame chassis made out of tubular steel round tubes are the best because the loading is so complex and there's many different load cases and directions uh, a quick way to remember how second moment of area works is a plastic ruler you might have had at school. In one direction, it's very, very floppy. If you turn it 90 degrees and try and bend it through its kind of vertical plane, it's very, very stiff. And that's a really nice way to help how to remember second moment of area works. And in the terms of the ruler, that's where this cube term changes. So in one direction, the cube will be working with you. In the other direction, the cube is not working with you. I've done a quick calculation of some typical kind of bike tube shapes. And we can see how this four power term really does increase the stiffness massively. So, so down here we've got 40, actually that should say 36, but anyway, we've got a 40 millimeter tube with a two mil wall thickness and a 60 millimeter tube with a two, two mil wall thickness. And you can see how just by adding 20 mil to the outer diameter, so by eye, these tubes aren't that different, but this one is about eight times stiffer than the 40 mil tube with the same wall thickness. So it really like diameter really makes a massive difference for comparison's sake a 27.2 mil seat post and a 25.4 mil seat post so you can see that increasing the diameter just a little bit really makes a huge difference in stiffness and it makes more of a difference this is what i'm saying it makes more of a distance a difference than just changing from let's say aluminium to carbon alone doing that might increase the stiffness at best by a factor of two here we're in increasing the stiffness by around eight times how do we equate this to what happens in bikes? Well, this is the driving equation for basically cantilevered beam deflection. Now, cantilevered beam is basically a beam which is fixed at one end and free at the other. And we assume that the, 
the load or the force is applied at kind of the free end. So you get deflection in the fork, could be from a front impact or a braking force or something like that, or fr tyre friction. And then we have deflection on the seat post, which comes from bump loads and, and rider weight and stuff like that. And I've just illustrated on this, on the fork example, what the diagram looks like for beam deflection, basically. So you've got the length of the beam, L. You've got the force, you can't really change that. That's just what happens when you're out riding. The deflection is this delta B term. So we can see in the equation, all that's left is three times EI. Three is a constant. And so EI is the only thing we can actually influence to change the compliance or stiffness of this tube. So that's why we're focusing on EI, and that's what happens in the bike. So quickly, we're going to look at some actual cases of bike parts in a simulation. Now, hopefully you can see this on the screen. I've drawn some different uh, tube shapes, quite, quite common bike tube shapes. And we've actually just looked at seat posts here. Uh, a couple of 27.2 seat posts, one carbon, one aluminium. We've got the Thompson Elite seat post, which I've drawn up in CAD, which is actually a very stiff aluminium seat post. We've got a kind of generic D-shaped seat post, something like a, a BMC team machine. I don't know the exact dimensions, but I've kind of guessed. We've got the exact dimensions of my TCR ISP seat post, which I've modelled here with the correct wall thickness, and a kind of a generic aero, aero-ish uh, seat tube profile there. And what I've done, just to illustrate this point, is I've applied the same load to each one in bending, and let's see what happens. The same force to every post, and we can see a massive difference in, in this case, what we could call com compliance. Now, we can see, uh, first one is the carbon 27.2 seat post. Next one is the aluminium 27.2 seat post. And then interestingly, we've got the Thompson Elite seat post, which is aluminium, and we can see on that one, it bends less than the carbon, the standard carbon 27.2 2 mil wall seat post. So that is a very stiff seat post and I can vouch for that. I've ridden one for a long time on my Super 6 and I got rid of it because it was too stiff. Second, uh, next to that is kind of the generic D-shaped seat post. It's quite compliant because you've cut off a lot of the second moment of area from the back of the, the circle essentially. Uh, then I've got the TCR ISP which I modelled, which I took the dimension straight from the, tier, the uh, TCR. And then finally, a kind of 40, I think it's 45 mil deep aero profile seat post with the same wall thickness. And this basically goes to show, and I've always said it, why I won't ride a bike with a deep aerofoil shaped seat post is essentially they're just too stiff. Unless you live in the Middle East with perfectly flat racetrack roads, they're just too uncomfortable for, for most people. And it's not just a comfort thing, it's not just a compliance thing. And I've said this before, tube stiffness isn't just about power transfer and comfort, which we're told by the bike industry. It's all about traction. It's about braking traction, braking modulation. If you've got a very stiff seat post, uh, the dynamic accelerations of your, your body as you go over bumps will be very harsh, and that will make for quite a wooden, harsh braking feel on the, on the rear brake. If you've got a bit of softness in the tail, as when you're when you're seated, you can influence how the braking feels and how much braking traction you'll get through the back end of the bike. It's the same with the fork, like I discussed on the TCR review. But yeah, this is this is just a nice little illustration of a couple of different materials, and this is the combination of what EI does for you. So we've got in here Young's modulus effects and second moment of area, and then after that, like I said, there's nothing else to compare. I hope you've got a good understanding now of how stiffnesses of tubes are influenced. When you see a bike, bicycle manufacturer saying, oh, this is 60% stiffer than the old one, and actually they haven't changed the outer diameter or they've made it smaller, you can kind of predict that that's rubbish because now you know all there is to understand about tube bending stiffness. Anyway, thanks for joining another kind of long-winded engineering video. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below if I've missed anything. Cheers, see you in the next one.